Hi everyone and thank you very much for tuning into our webinar today. We are talking to you from CRCC Asia's London office and the topic that we're going to be talking to you about today is China's history and culture. My name is Hannah and I'm the UK marketing and PR coordinator here at CRCC Asia London and I'm joined today by my colleague Lizzie. Hi, I'm the marketing associate here in the London office. And Lizzie and myself have both spent time um, living um, in China and we, we both also studied um, Chinese history at university. So if you have any questions um, related to China's history um, or living in China more generally um, or our experience of our time there, then please do feel free to ask. Um, you can ask questions throughout the webinar um, by just typing into the box on the um, bottom right hand corner and we will come to answer all your questions um, at the end of our presentation once we've finished going through the slides. So as you know our topic today um, is China's um, history and culture so I'll just switch over to the um, presentation slide now um, so that you can see the PowerPoint. Okay, so now you should be able to see um, our PowerPoint presentation. Um, so as you know, the topic today is Chinese history and culture. Um, this is obviously a very um, large topic, but it's also one that is very important to understand if you um, have an interest in China and if you ever decide to travel there um, for work or just for pleasure. Um, China has one of the world's longest standing civilizations, um, which has been going for over 5,000 years. So it has an extremely rich and varied history um, which still has an important influence on China today. Um, so it's essential to have an awareness of China's long history um, if you want to be able to understand modern day um, China um, and Chinese culture. So um, this is what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, we will start um, by um, going through China's um, history um, from right back um, the dynastic periods right up until um, modern day. Um, so my colleague Lizzie will talk you through um, the empires and um, the transition um, from dynastic rule to um, modern day China and the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and then I will give um, an introduction to um, four cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. So these are the four locations where we run um, our China internship program. Um, just to give you a better idea um, of what to expect from each of those cities and a more detailed um, understanding of their specific histories. Um, so here you can see quite an iconic image of China. This is a picture of the terracotta warriors in Xi'an, um, which really symbolize ancient China. Um, so these terracotta warriors um, were built by China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, um, to watch over him um, in the afterlife um, in Xi'an, because this was the city um, that um, Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor, established um, as China's um, ancient capital. Um, so now I'll hand over to my colleague Lizzie to talk you through um, um, dynastic rule. Okay, so as Hannah just pointed out, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi was the first emperor in China. Um, so he established the Qin dynasty, which was regarded as the first time when China could be unified and talked about as one country. Prior to this, it had just been divided by various warlord groups um, and had never really been sort of seen as one big country. Um, Qin Shi Huangdi was 
regarded as having the mandate of heaven. So he was a divine emperor chosen by the heavens. Um, but as a result of this, all his actions and if anything happened in the empire, a natural disaster, for example, it was all regarded as uh, through his poor ruling and he was criticized heavily for this. Um, following the Qin was the start of the Han Dynasty. Um, the Han gave the name to what we now know as sort of the largest Chinese ethnic group. Um, they, it was a really important time in Chinese history because it opened up lots of trade routes, um, the famous Silk Roads um, and other important trading opportunities. Um, following this, there was a period of the Middle Dynasties, then the Song, um, and then there was a period of occupation under Genghis Khan and the Mongolians. The next Chinese dynasty was the Ming, which was a really important time in establishing sort of what we now think of as ancient China. The civil service examination, for example, um, which caused a huge amount of class divide within China, and but also had great cultural influence. Um, there was a lot of studying of ancient philosophy and a lot of famous thinkers around at this time. Um, and the final uh, imperial dynasty was the Qing dynasty, um, but it was criticized as being backward and um, the last emperor was just a two-year-old boy uh, known as Pui. And it was toppled by uh, a peasant or a, a popular uprising. Okay, so um, the Republican period was the next big period in China. Um, this was a time of real prosperity following the fall of the Qing. Um, a lot of Western influences were allowed into China. A lot of wealthy people had gone to study abroad and they were returning to China with Western ideas of science and medicine. Um, as well as lots of important intellectual debates, including um, ones about women's rights, equality, um, the end of class dif differences. Um, so really important time for thinking and other social issues. Um, Yuan Shikai was the president of the Republic of China, but he got a little power happy and refused to allow democratic election. And so unfortunately, this period of real opportunity fell into sort of disarray um, and a period of instability and civil war. Um, the Sino-Japanese War also took place during the Republic of China um, and um, the, this was, the Japanese invaded and it's famous for its Nanj the Nanjing Massacre which was a series of atrocities that happened in Nanjing. Um, however, as a result of uh, the Japanese invasion, um, uh, the Chinese people established a much better sense of cultural identity and patriotism was really strong at this point. Um, the communists and the nationalist party, who were sort of the two leading um, political parties at this time, formed a united front to um, fight against the Japanese. And the communists really took this opportunity to go into the peasant villages um, and, you know, capitalized on the idea of a wartime economy as being the implementation of their communist policies. Um, so through guerrilla tactics, tactics um, during this period and uh, things such as the Long March and other, uh, um, the communists managed to win the hearts of the peasants and. At the end of the Civil War, um, they emerged victorious. Um, so the next period is known as New China, or the, um, this was following the Communist Revolution in 1949. Um, at this point, Mao named himself the Chairman of China and established the People's Republic of China as we know it today. Um, so within this uh, period of um, up until the present, really, there were three important events um, to think about. So there's the Great Leap Forward, which happened in the 1950s, which was um, a move to industrialize China and increase 
participation in a national work ethic throughout national work ethic effort throughout the whole country um so uh, it was really important for mobilizing all the peasants to participate in this um following that there was the cultural revolution which many of you i'm sure will have heard of um it was the idea to rid society of bourgeois influence and an attack on the four olds being culture, habit, cus customs and thinking. Um, so it basically encouraged anyone from wealthy backgrounds to be sent down to the countryside for re-education and peasants and those of a good class background were put in power. Um, lots of students enlisted in the Red Guards and there was a lot of radical revolutionary behaviour at this time. Um, the final sort of period um, to talk about is that of the 1989 student demonstrations in Tiananmen Square. Um, students gathered in the square to protest against the lack of democracy in China um, and the government uh, took, took this as an attack on the government as a whole and so enforced martial law um, and it resulted in a rather bloody massacre. Um, it's now a really taboo subject in China, so if you are there on one of the internship programmes, it's probably best not to mention it. Okay, great. Thanks, Lizzie, very much for that um, very insightful introduction to Chinese history. Um, obviously, we can't cover absolutely everything with <laughs> such a um, long um, and rich history, but we hope to gave you the important details there. So now I'll talk to you more about um, four cities in China, um, our cities where we organize the China internship program. So the first of these you um, will probably have heard of before, it's the capital of China, Beijing. So the literal translation um, of Beijing is northern, <coughs> northern capital, um, Beijing was originally established as China's capital under Kublai Khan um, when it was known as Dadu, which means grand capital. Um, this was during the Yuan dynasty um, back in 1279 and it has um, been China's capital um, ever since this except for two brief interludes. Um, during the Ming and Qing dynasties, China, um, Beijing was built into the vast complex um, that it is known for today. So this is when iconic cultural sites such as the Forbidden City and Summer Palace were constructed. Um, they're really important locations um, and if you're ever in Beijing, um, you should really make sure that you go and see them. One of the fascinating um, things about Beijing is how um, you can see the old um, features of the city side by side with it, its newly um, more industrialized features. Um, so a lot of this industrialization took place after Beijing was named the host city of the 2008 um, Olympic Games, which um, is probably something else that you already know about um, Beijing. So the Olympic Games um, gave Beijing the opportunity to um, modernize itself even further, adding iconic architecture um, such as the Bird's Nest Stadium, which was designed by renowned artist Ai Weiwei. The Great Wall is one of the most well-recognized symbols of China, and um, you can see it here. It's one of the um, the only man-made structure that can actually be seen from space. Um, its construction began in 220 BC and it continued to be fortified right up until the Ming Dynasty 2000 years later, making it one of the um, longest construction projects um, in the history, um, not just of China, but also of the world. Um, it covers um, a long stretch um, running across northeastern China, but it is also reachable um, within a short distance from Beijing. Um, so if you are ever passing through Beijing, it's a must-see site, um, one of the wonders of the world, and definitely can't miss it um, on a trip 
to China. So the second city um, that we will talk about today is Shanghai, which is um, another one of China's most famous um, and international cities. So I imagine you would have heard of it before. The name Shanghai literally translates as um, on the sea. Um, and it became China's truly international city um, after the first opium wars, um, as its um, international ports were established there, um, thanks to its strategic location um, on the east coast of China. Um, so these ports um, meant um, that foreign concessions were also established um, within Shanghai, um, and these um, um, also gave way to um, a lot of Western architecture that you can still see in Shanghai today. Shanghai is a city really flourished during the Republican period um, that Lizzie um, explained to you earlier. So this was a time um, in between the fall of the last empire, um, the last dynasty, um, and before um, the communists took power. Um, and during this time, there was a huge influx of Western influences um, into, um, onto Chinese thinkers. Um, and a lot of these came through Shanghai. Um, as this is where a lot of um, foreigners were based in the country. Um, and likewise, a lot of Chinese artists and writers and philosophers um, were also based in Shanghai. Um, and there's still um, a heavy foreign influence on Shanghai today, not just in Shanghai's architecture, but also in the people who live there. So Shanghai is home to China's, China's largest expat um, community. So if you're traveling there as an intern, um, you certainly won't be alone. Um, Shenzhen um, is another um, very important city um, in China. It's located um, on Chinese, China's southeastern coast um, in the Pearl River Delta. Um, and it is, it has a population of roughly 15 million people. Um, so it is still an extremely large city um, by modern day standards. Um, uh, so you can see its location on the right, on the left hand side and on its right, you can see a picture of modern day Shenzhen. Um, it has a vibrant economy thanks to its um, position um, on the coast of um, Southern mainland China. Um, and it's an important financial center as well. It's home to the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Um, and thanks to this major investments flow into Shenzhen, um, both foreign and Chinese investments. So um, Shenzhen has seen a huge rise in the technology and manufacturing industries, which has earned it the nickname of the Silicon Valley of China. Although today Shenzhen has a reputation for being a large metropolitan city, um, this was not the same um, 40 to 50 years ago. Shenzhen is a prime example of the um, massive period of development that China has experienced over the past um, 30 or so years. And it really is one of um, modern China's success stories. So you can see here on the right um, how Shenzhen looked about 50 years ago. It was just a fishing village um, with a population of just 300,000 people. But it, Shenzhen underwent major changes under um, the economic reforms implemented by Deng Xiaoping, who was the leader of the Chinese Communist Party from 1978 to 1989. Um, so he took after, he took over um, leading the party after the death of Mao Zedong. Um, so Deng Xiaoping believed that with the right policies and um, reform efforts, China could flourish as an economic power under socialist rule. He engineered reforms to manage the exploding population, most notably China's one-child policy, and also in instituted economic policies to encourage businesses um, and financial growth in China. The most important of these reforms for Shenzhen was the special economic zones. 
Special economic zones were areas where the government would allow more free market orientated economic policies to attract um, businesses to set up there and foreign um, investors to invest in the businesses there. And Shenzhen was named as China's first economic zone in 1980. Nowadays, Shenzhen is the home of financial investment um, with a booming technology and manufacturing um, industry. Um, it is home to many uh, man manufacturing and technology companies um, right through from the major players um, to small startups as well, um, who all come to Shenzhen um, for its reputation as China's technology hub. And largely thanks to his policy um, developing these special economic zones, Deng Xiaoping is largely um, credited for Shenzhen's success as a city um, and is therefore honored with this portrait in Shenzhen. Here you can see some pictures um, of sites in Shenzhen's Nanshan district. Nanshan is the area in Shenzhen that houses the high-tech industrial park which is the home of many startups and tech companies, for example, um, Tencent, um, and it's also home to Shenzhen City Hall. So if you choose to do an internship in Shenzhen, then these are the places that you need to see. So the last city that um, we will talk to you about today is Hong Kong. Hong Kong's name literally translates um, as fragrant harbour, um, and indeed it is um, a very important harbour located on the southeast coast of China and um, just across the border from Shenzhen um, also in China's Pearl River Delta. So after the first opium war, um, Hong Kong was claimed as a British colony. Then during the Second World War, the island came under control um, of the Japanese, but it was eventually reclaimed after the end of the Second World War war by the British. In 1997, um, power of Hong Kong was finally transferred back to from Britain to the People's Republic of China. Hong Kong became um, a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China following this transfer, meaning that it operates under China's one country, two systems policy. This special designation means that it is an autonomous territory, so it's responsible for its own economic and legal affairs, um, but it answers to the mainland um, on any issues regarding diplomatic affairs and international defense. This more hands-off approach has allowed Hong Kong to thrive as a haven for free market enterprise. Back in the late 1970s, Hong Kong was a major international port um, for goods to be traded, attracting people from both Europe and China. Now it is known as the world's freest economy due to its support for free trade and low taxation. Hong Kong does not have sales tax, VAT or capital gains tax, making it a very attractive um, location for businesses to set up and the Hong Kong um, Stock Exchange is the seventh largest in the world. Um, so if you would like to know more about Hong Kong, um, we held a webinar on that exact topic earlier this year. Um, so please do check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, it can tell you more about um, living in Hong Kong as a city um, and the attractions that you should see there. And um, so if you're interested in Hong Kong, it's definitely worth um, having a look at that webinar. Um, and at the moment, CRCC Asia are running a summer sale. So during the month of August, if you apply um, and um, pay a deposit before the 31st of August, then you are entitled to 50% off um, your um, deposit. So now if you're considering um, traveling to China for an internship, then now is a really great time to get your application in and take advantage of the summer sale. 
it's very simple to apply. Just go onto our website, crccasia.com, and click the red apply button in the corner. It's a very simple application form, um, and there's no application fee. CRCC Asia are very active on social media. And so you're watching this through Google Plus, or perhaps you're watching it through our YouTube channel. But um, we also have pages on Facebook, Twitter, and we have an Instagram site. So um, if you're interested in what we do or want the latest news on China, then um, it's a really great idea to follow those. We also have the Chinese equivalent, so um, Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, and Yoku, the Chinese um, YouTube. And if you are interested in um, our internships or, and want to find out more, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with your nearest local office. So um, Lizzie and I are both in the London office, but um, if you're watching this from further afield, then one of our other offices might be closer to you. Um, so thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, and if you do have any questions about what we've been talking to you about, then now is the time to ask. Um, so I hope that um, you have learned something from today's um, talk and um, found it useful. If you want any more detailed information about anything, then please don't hesitate to ask us. Um, and you can ask by clicking on the, um, by writing your question in the box on the bottom right hand corner. Um, okay, everyone, so thank you very much for joining our webinar today. And um, this webinar will shortly be available on YouTube. So um, if you want to watch it again or recommend it to any friends or family, then um, YouTube is the place to find it. Um, if you do have any questions, then um, now is the time to ask. Um, but if not, then that concludes our webinar today. Um, so thank you everyone again very much for joining us. Um, and if you have any questions about um, China, or Chinese history, or the internship programs that we run, um, then, like I said, don't hesitate to um, get in touch with us. Um, we're always happy to speak to um, future interns, or if you've already been on one of our programs in the past, then we'd love to hear from our alumni as well. Um, so please don't hesitate to get in touch, and we hope to hear from you. Okay, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Bye. Bye.